Hello, welcome to Revenant Reads. I'm Vin, and it's time to break out the Greek Xiphos again, because we're once again talking about ancient Greek history and ancient Greek warfare, uh, and yet another landmark edition, this time Xenophon's Hellenica. So I, I read this landmark edition of Xenophon's Hellenica for Historathon 2023. Uh, which is a year-long reading event uh, that I created, but I'm joined by some awesome co-hosts, and I've got a whole bunch of other great people who are joining us for a year-long celebration of reading nonfiction history, uh, reading it, discussing it, promoting it, celebrating it. And we have divided the year up into four quarters. Uh, the first quarter, the first three months of the year, is ending um, as I record this. And we were looking at each quarter, we are looking at a different time period. Um, and the first quarter was prehistory up to 500 CE. So as a part of that, I read you know, a good number of books. Most of them ended up being about ancient Greece. Um, now, I had actually, I wanted to read some stuff on ancient Rome uh, this quarter, but I just didn't get to it. Um, but I did end up reading two different landmark editions of Xenophon. So I've already made a video from the previous month uh, Xenophon's Anabasis, which I liked quite a bit. Uh, and I was told, though, that the other work that he is well known for, the more extensive work, um, or sorry, I should say another extensive work, Hellenica, uh, is a much drier read than Anabasis, and that I would not like it as much. So I kind of, you know, I had that in my mind as I went in. And I have to say, I did still end up enjoying this. Now, Anabasis really has the benefit of being one long story arc, and that is not what this is. Um, this is Xenophon trying to look at the history of his times uh, from really the end or last years of the Peloponnesian War up to around the first half, the end of the first half of the fourth century BCE. Um, and it is a different creature than Anabasis. Um, you know, Anabasis uh, was a much shorter period of time. There is a clear kind of beginning to end. There's an overall story arc. We're following the same basic people, and that's not what happens with this. Now, I love these landmark editions. Um, this is the fourth landmark edition that I have read. Uh, they are really, really good for reading these ancient texts, especially, especially if you're new to them. Um, they provide images and footnotes and marginalia and... There's another, some more images. Um, the images help you to see what the artifacts would have looked like or the material culture of the time. Um, the landscape, especially for different battles. We get plenty of maps to show us where we're talking about, um, especially when you're talking about ancient Greece with all, all these independent city-states. It is very helpful to figure out exactly where we are discussing. And especially for something like this. Um, I think that my enjoyment in reading this was definitely increased by reading the landmark version of it. I think that if I had read it in a different format, in a different edition, uh, I might have I might have struggled with it a little bit more. Um, because another thing that the landmark does is they have very good introductory essays, and the introductory essay for this is quite thorough, and it does give I think some pretty good expectations here. Uh, Unlike somebody like Herodotus, um, who was the first to really start writing in prose uh, for history, and Thucydides, who, to my understanding, didn't have too many competitors, um, Xenophon, I think, is writing at a time when writing history has become more extensive. Uh, there are more people doing it. So he is writing to an audience who might have even been his close friends. We're not entirely sure. Uh, he is writing to an audience who already has a good amount of background knowledge, who has probably also read other histories on the same time period. So he's assuming a certain knowledge in the reader. Uh, so you have to be cautious with that in the first place. And also, he does have certain biases. Um, he's Athenian. However, he did end up getting uh, exiled by Athens. Um, he appears to have been part of the cavalry in Athens, and the cavalry supported in, I guess, I think they were kind of the muscle for the 30 tyrants uh, that really terrorized uh, Athens before democracy was restored. Um, and to his credit, he does, actually in a second book, this is, there's seven books in here, the second book, he deals with the 30 tyrants and he does uh, condemn them 
Um, but he doesn't talk about the fact that he was likely actually <laughs> working for them. Uh, so, you know, you can have regrets all these years later, but at the time, he seems to have been an enforcer for them. And um, maybe for that, uh, I'm not entirely sure, I don't know if they know exactly, but maybe for that, he seems to have been exiled uh, from Athens. So he goes and he lives with, in Sparta, um, which was, of course, the enemy of Athens during the Peloponnesian War. And he's really kind of a, you know, he has a, he has a definite bias for Sparta. Um, and with that, you know, there are certain things, of course, that he is not going to tell us. Uh, he leaves out things, the introductory talks about the, the introduction talks about this, um, things like the uh, Second Athenian League and uh, some big things that are happening at this time period that he doesn't really talk about. Uh, now, is he lying? No, it's he's not really lying. He seems to actually be pretty, pretty reliable uh, for the most part. It's just that he's selective in what he is showing. Now, as far as the the enjoyment of reading. The first two books um, has been divided into seven books. I don't think it was divided during his time. I think that was later uh, people who divided them. The first book really picks up where Thucydides have left, had left off. He was writing about the Peloponnesian War, but he it, it ends kind of right, uh, <laughs> almost in mid-sentence. Um, he probably died while he was writing it, so he didn't get to finish it. So Xenophon picks up right where Thucydides leaves off. I mean, the first book is really about the end of the Peloponnesian War and the victory of Sparta over Athens. The second book, like I said before, deals with the reign of the 30 tyrants, mostly. Um, and those two chapters are actually quite compelling. I really like those. Uh, and then from then on, this is where I think the reputation for the dryness maybe starts setting in. And I wouldn't call it dry. Um, and especially because I read it in this edition, which I think helped keep me engaged and gave me the context for what I was reading. But from then on, we start kind of bouncing around geographically. Uh, we mostly follow a chronological order, although sometimes we kind of go back in time and you know, almost like a flashback. Uh, but we're mostly following a chronological order, but we're bouncing around the Mediterranean, and not the Mediterranean, but really the Aegean. Um, we might be over in Persia for a little while, and then we're following certain Greek city-states, and then we're following different Greek city-states. And we're always following war and conflict. But you, you bounce around so much that, you know, you're not always sure exactly where this one is going and, you know, what's the resolution to the earlier thing. It, there's not, you know, for that kind of history today, we would we would look for some kind of overriding thesis, you know, <laughs> or some kind of basic thread that would guide all of these things. But we don't necessarily have that. Um, we do have the um, him promoting the cavalry quite a bit, um, but... Otherwise, there's, you know, there's nothing to really tie it together. The introduction describes it as episodic and anecdotal, and I think that's a pretty good way to explain it. Um, now, the individual episodes, there's always fascinating things in there, but because you're not always sure where you're taking, where he's taking you or why he's taking you there, I think you do have to be patient with the book. And like I said, having the, um, the extra materials in here, uh, like the maps, not just the geographic maps, but maps of different areas, temples, where people might have, uh, you know, been, been hiding out or altars and attacks, all that sort of thing. That really does help to keep those episodes that he's talking about um, more engaging uh, and just provides more context for what it is that he's discussing. So, like I said, if I didn't have those materials, I think that I would be less patient with the book. But because I read this edition, I still ended up enjoying it quite a bit. Uh, not as much as Anabasis. Anabasis has a nice thrilling narrative that goes pretty much throughout. Um, the last part of the book, there, you don't have quite nearly as much tension um, uh, or urgency to what's going on. But still, it's it's a fun book. And this one is, again, not as, not as engaging in that way. But if you're somebody who likes ancient history, I would definitely recommend reading this in this edition, certainly. Um, and, you know, it did introduce me to another figure that I thought was quite interesting. Um, I'm probably saying the name wrong, but I think it's Thristibulus. Um, I can't pronounce anything Greek, so I'm probably butchering that if I'm not, not only misremembering it. Uh, but essentially he is somebody that helped restore democracy to Athens and even brought democracy to Byzantium. Uh, and he's unfortunately murdered in a tent. Um, but in a kind of rare move, Xenophon, who is not much of a Democrat. Um, he seems to prefer oligarchical rule uh, based on the way that he describes things and what he, 
you know, his, his overall attitude in here. Um, but even he says that, um, that that individual had the reputation for being a good man, which he doesn't say very often in here. Uh, so anyhow, uh, I would once again recommend a landmark edition. Um, I do love these editions. And uh, I'm not sure when I'm going to get to another one of these again. Um, I think next year for Historathon 2024, um, I see this event as being annual. Even if nobody else joins me, I'll still be doing it. Um, I think we're going to read Polybius, and there's no landmark edition for that. Um, so we might not get to another one until maybe Arian or Caesar. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. So it might be at least another two years or so before I get to a landmark edition. But I do... You know, once again, I highly endorse these. I had a great time with them. And uh, if you've ever read it, I'd certainly love to hear your thoughts. And I always love an excuse to break out my Xiphos. So, as always, thank you, BookTube.